Hi, Dr. Welgan again. Yesterday I mentioned that we're going to be moving on in this series of uh, discussions on biofeedback. So this is lecture number two. I told you a little bit about myself in this field, what I'm doing as a clinician, what I have done over the years at the University of California, Irvine, okay? And my specialty area is over here in research, but I'll do a lot clinically with biofeedback, I'll tell you about later. But what is biofeedback? You've heard the term? Uh, yep, uh, it's popular. It, uh, remember, uh, biofeedback's been around a long time. It goes back to the early 70s, okay? It's a term that was actually coined uh, by a psychologist, uh, actually two of them, uh, Barbara Brown, University of California, uh, Southern California, and uh, Joe Camillo, uh, psychologist at um, the uh, Neuropsychiatric Institute at Berkeley, uh, Langley Porter. Okay, we back when, and they were very interested in some ways clinically out uh, beyond the rest of us who were coming on board, but kind of pointed the way, okay? But what did they point the way about? What, what, what was all this about clinically, okay? Because it, the precursor for biofeedback as a clinical tool really started several years earlier in research labs, okay, back in the mid-60s. In my research lab, in the late 60s and 70s at the University of Wisconsin and the Milwaukee General Hospital, where I conducted my own experimental research, not in therapy, as a therapy, but as basic research in this field, was back in the late 60s and early 70s. So it's been around a while, the precursors to biofeedback. What is biofeedback? Biofeedback is very simple. All it is is an amplification system. An amplification system that is basically electronic that actually senses what's going on inside of your body. You put electrodes on different parts of your body and with the right filtering system, you actually pick up what's going on in that organ system. You can actually see it bioelectrically, if you put it on an oscilloscope or you put it on a, a later uh, a, a monitor, okay? Computer monitor. You can actually hook yourself up to a monitor and watch what's happening inside of you. Well, why is that so important? To be able to actually watch what the heck is going on inside of your body. Well, it became the foundation of some really important theoretical discussions that had been going on for years in experimental psychology. And it was this. Down through history, since Hippocrates, you have two branches of the nervous system. You got the central nervous system that controls the muscles, spinal cord, cortex, it actually allows you to manipulate your fingers and walk around. It's the voluntary system. It's the one that allows me to move in a voluntary fashion. Okay? Central. There's another one. The autonomic nervous system has two branches. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. That nervous system, way back there, controls the limbic system and other structures underneath the cortex and all the visceral organs. Yeah, the liver, pancreas, gastrointestinal tract, cardiovascular function, etc. Well, when were you ever able to do this with your pancreas? Or do this with your stomach or colon? Or this with your cardiovascular system? Never. And that was the reason why medicine, neurologists, physiologists, down through the ages, have always determined that the autonomic nervous system is outside of voluntary control. Auto means self. Nomic means it's self-regulatory. 
So forget about trying to control it. Uh, it's all controlled back there. Right, 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 right. So many of the medical conditions that are long-lasting, intransigent, and resistant to conventional medical intervention are all controlled by the autonomic nervous system. A lot of medications, surgery, we do a lot of things here, but after all, it is the automatic vegetative nervous system, and you ain't going to do anything about it yourself. We've got to treat you. Well, the psychophysiologists and learning theorists took a little different point of view. And they said, look, the difference between the feedback you get from the autonomic nervous system and how your liver functions and your pancreas functions and how your fingers function has a lot to do with sensory feedback. I mean, I can feel my fingers moving, and if, if I can do that, if I, if I can sense them, I can move them. Uh, but if I hand, my hand goes numb somehow, or, you know, I sleep on it or something like that, I wake up and it's numb. Try doing that with that hand. You can't practically do anything with it. In other words, the sensory feedback is essentially obstructed by the lack of oxygen to those nerves, which actually produces numbness. And if I've got a numb hand, I might as well have an autonomic nervous system function because I can't feel it until blood flow is restored, and now the sensory nerves now actually become uh, uh, operational, and there is called an afferent nerve feedback. Afferent means a sensation that's coming back into the body that allows now the brain to produce a bioelectric process sending a signal down the efferent nerves, which allow me to move my finger. Afferent, efferent, okay? We have the same kind of a nervous system set up in the autonomic nervous system, but it doesn't give you enough information about what the heck is going on. It's self-regulatory and under the level of consciousness, awareness. However, if you put a, an electrode on something, hook it up to a monitor so that I can actually hear what is going on, guess what happens when you play around with this? You can actually begin to manipulate that monitor. If I'm manipulating that monitor, I'm actually manipulating this. I can actually see that, put a microphone over there and hear it and I get the kind of feedback I need to be able to control what I see there. But what I see there really is driven by what's happening here. If I can control that, I'm actually controlling that. I always like to liken this to, you got a dog and you got a tail. The dog wags the tail. In conventional medical parlance, the autonomic nervous system governs that organ. No, that organ can actually, that tail can actually wag the dog. Really? The tail wagging the dog? Yeah, if I can manipulate that end organ right there, I am actually because that end, an end organ is being served by that nervous system, I'm actually changing the function of that nervous system by manipulating this, whatever that is, and I'll tell you about that later. So, it didn't take long for clinicians to kind of figure out, those of us who are standing on stage saying, hey, look, take a look what we're doing here in the labs, for them to say, whoo, I think this might work with a variety of my patients who have medical conditions for which very poor treatment alternatives are available, okay? And you don't, you don't cure these kinds of things, generally. These are chronic, constant, cyclic, 
I'll tell you more about those conditions later. But the important thing is, if I can actually learn how to control that noise screen, I'm actually learning how to control an organ system. It was pretty exciting stuff, and it continues to be for a lot of people who really know how to use this, who know how to use this effectively. That's another lecture. So biofeedback has been around for a long time and being used with various levels of understanding and expertise by practitioners out there, unfortunately. I hate to say this, but, you know, probably the people who know how to do this best are my friends in experimental laboratories that are still working with rats, so to speak. You know, they don't come out. Um, I came out, and I said, hey, look, interesting stuff going on back there, okay? Probably you need somebody with a lot of understanding of learning theory, learning theory and behavior modification before that works. Okay, so there have been varying degrees of success to a large degree. It has to do with, in my estimation, the degree of understanding and expertise of the practitioner using this in practice. I've been watching this for a long time. Okay, so my point is this. Hook up a monitor to an organ. Try to help your, the individual sitting there with this apparatus attached to him and ask him to learn how to actually control what he sees and what he hears. And don't be surprised, regardless of the organ system, that you begin to see the individual with that kind of sensory feedback coming into the brain. Ah, mm, ah, ah, ah. And you learn how to do this trial and error. Trial and error. You never learn anything without trial and error. Bum, bum, bum. I see. Yes, I see. Bum, bum. Got it. Okay? That is a skill building process. And you want to go into psychotherapy and determine whether or not your anger toward your mother at three years of age was had a major impact on you at 55? I have no problem with you doing that. But if you really want to try to, wow, do what? Actually learn how to develop some tools to be able to help myself now with this process here. It is very pragmatic, very practical, very behavioral and very goal-oriented. I see it as a wonderful tool for patients with a variety of psychological, psychosomatic, and somatic conditions when used properly. Okay, so that is biofeedback. There are monitors for a a physiologic monitors for a variety of organ system functions. One of the more important movements uh, today is in EEG control, and that is controlling brain waves, which, by the way, reflect a lot of cognitive processes here, and it's being used very effectively with patients who have ADD, ADHD, EEG feedback. I used to use this with my epileptic patients to control seizures, petite and grand mal seizures. Now, how do you do that? I mean, I'm not a physician and I'm not treating them medically. All I am doing is controlling and helping them control EEGs. That's it. It's a skill. So I'm not a practicing physician, a psychophysiologist trying to help an individual control a particular body part. That's only one, but today, in the field of uh, applied psychophysiology and biofeedback, you'll find many clinicians becoming very well trained in that area. By the way, for those of you who have a little more interest in learning more about this, one of the organs here that uh, is available to those who are practicing uh, 
uh, biofeedback, and it is called Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. It's been around a long time. I know many of the guys in the organization are clinicians, many of them are researchers, and applying what they know in a clinical practice. So Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. Only one uh, professional journal I'm showing you here, but there are others as well. Journal of Behavioral Medicine, by the way, is another one you might want to take a look at. And uh, really the one that, uh, as a researcher, I'm interested in, and that is Psychophysiology, produced by the Society for Psychophysiological Research. Those are three really very good uh, resources for you if you decide to explore this a little further, okay? Okay, we're going to pause today, and we will talk tomorrow more about biofeedback. And I'd like to talk to you about the kind of research that has been conducted since the early 70s um, up to the current uh, point in time here, and what's going on right now. Okay, good. Look forward to uh, talking with you tomorrow.